So again, welcome everybody to Friends of the North Fork of the Shenandoah River's Spring Lecture Series, 250 Years on the North Fork, Looking Back and Looking Ahead. So this year we were really inspired by Shenandoah County's 250th anniversary, and we put together a group of presentations to examine the history of human interaction with the North Fork over time, the ecological impacts associated, and how we can move forward together to protect the river that we all love. And if you don't know, Friends of the North Fork was founded in 1988 we're a community-based river conservation organization with the mission to keep the North Fork of the Shenandoah River clean, healthy, and beautiful through advocacy, community action, education, and science. So today we are gonna be hearing from Kristen Lays, who is the executive director of the Bell Grove Plantation. And she's gonna be talking to us about early settlement in the Shenandoah Valley as seen through the eyes of the Height family beginning in the 1730s. Kristen Lays, um, the Executive Director of Bell Grove Plantation, which is a historic property of the National Trust for Historic Preservation located in Middletown, Virginia. Bell Grove is a nonprofit partner in C Cedar Creek and Bell Grove National Historic Park. She joined Bell Grove in 2013, and in addition to managing daily operations and special events, she coordinates research on the African-American history of the site, including archeology. span In 2018 to 2019, she oversaw the restoration of the 1918 barn to become the Beverly B. Shoemaker Welcome Center. This was the largest infrastructure improvement to the historic property since being founded in 1967. Previously, Ms. Lays served as Executive Vice President of Heritage Preservation, a Washington DC based national organization that advocated for the care of collections. There she directed several initiatives, including the Heritage Health Index, the first comprehensive survey of the condition and preservation needs of US collections. She holds a BA in history from Earlham College in Richmond, Indiana, and an MA in art history from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she worked with the History of Cartography Project. Miss Lays lives with her husband, Jim, and dog, Maggie, in Winchester, Virginia. And with that, I will get it started with Kristen. Thank you, Julia. I appreciate that nice introduction and welcome everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Um, I'm gonna give you a presentation this evening about how the Height family came to the Valley and how water was um, sort of central in all of that. Um, I hope I'm not going to go um, on too long, drone on too long about about some of these topics. And if it's you know if there's if I'm going over things you already know, then you know raise your hand, stop me. Um, but but I find I find this kind of history interesting, and um, I hope you do too. And then we should have plenty of time for questions at the end. So. Um, Here's a nice valley view. Um, I'm not sure actually where this spot is, but it sort of looks close to what I see when I've hiked up. Um, there's, a, there's an outlook on the Tuscarora Trail that I like to go on. Um, and so, you know, the Shenandoah Valley, you know, was 10,000 years ago in an ice age, um, 6,500 years ago. Um, the, the land form started to, to be created along um, the Blue Ridge with mixed forests that we still see today. Um, there were animal paths that were created then by the migration of animals through the forest and those later paths the human humans settlers would use. Um, and I think it's known by 900 AD there were established Native American villages um, that had domesticated plants. Um, and the groups included the Piedmont Siouxans, the Catawabas, the Shawnee, the Delaware, the Cherokee, the Susquehannocks, and the Iroquois. Um, and the Iroquois ultimately were part of a, a six nation tribe, which included the Mohawks, Oneidas, Onondagas, Cayugas, Senecas, and later the Tuscaroras. Um, eventually the, the Iroquois became the dominant uh, forest the dominant Native American group in the Shenandoah Valley and began to control 
these paths, these migration paths, which ultimately called the Great Warrior Path because of the Seneca warring um, reputation. Um, and then enter the European um, influence and eventually occupation of the Shenandoah Valley. So in September of 1649, King Charles II of England granted seven English noblemen um, 5,282,000 acres in Virginia between, and this is important, the Rappahannock and Potomac rivers. And this was known as the Northern Neck Proprietary. And since most of the land had never been mapped or explored and King Charles spent most of the mid 17th century in exile, the proprietors thought very little of their grant. It was just a gift on paper um, from, from this new country or this new territory. Um, however, Charles was restored to the throne, and by 1719, Thomas Fairfax, the sixth Lord Fairfax of Cameron, had inherited all of this land at the age of 26 years old. So, um, again, British noble people just sort of, this was just known on paper. Um, and today, that red arrow is approximately on this map. Uh, where Belgrove is. And we have a cat. I don't have a tail. <laughs> so I can become that internet sensation. Um, and this is, let's see. Uh, yeah, let me, let me go. I'll go on with the story. Uh, Lord Fairfax charged the acting royal governor of Virginia to explore the territory. And in 1716, Governor Spotswood with 50 other men, including four Meherin Indians, led an expedition up the Rappahannock River Valley and westward into the interior of Virginia. There they crossed the Blue Ridge Mountains at Swift Run Gap, which is now in Shenandoah National Park, and down Shenandoah Valley on the east side of the Massanutten Mountain and reached the Shenandoah River, which they termed the Euphrates. By the 1720s, much of the western part of the Northern Neck Proprietary was unmapped, and there was growing concern about the threat of Native Americans, especially, especially the powerful Iroquois, and the growing power of the French Canadians to the west. So if you're in the Shenandoah Valley today, that would be over the, the Allegheny Ridge that forms the western edge of the valley. In the late 1720s, there was also an influx of European immigrants fleeing religious persecution and political unrest, and affordable land was difficult to obtain in the increasingly populous eastern seaboard. Then colonial governor of Virginia, William Gooch, had been approached to allow settlements on the western side of the Blue Ridge, or what they termed the backside of Virginia, which I love. <laughs> He petitioned the British Crown to demonstrate to your lordships how soon that part of Virginia on the other side of the Great Mountains be peopled if proper encouragements for that purpose were given. Most of the petitioners are Germans and Swissers lately come into Pennsylvania or being disappointed of quality of land they expected, have chosen to fix their habitation in this uninhabited part of Virginia and for by this means, a strong barrier will be settled between us and the French. Um, this is a Shenandoah Valley image that uh, was done by artist William Louis Sontag, and it's in the Virginia Historical Society. So we've got this interest in having the area settled. Um, and since there were so many questions about the boundaries of the area, remember it's from the headwaters of the Rappahannock to, the, to the, that of the Potomac, Governor um, Gooch started to argue that this fell, this area, the Shindo Valley, fell outside of what is now um, we consider the valley. Um, so it was known that west of where the Shenandoah River meets the Potomac River at what is now Harper's Ferry, and I marked it on that map, and you can see the river boundary. Um, that river, so you you know the Shenandoah comes into the Potomac and they merge and then they head to Washington. Um, the Potomac was um, the northwest boundary. Um, oh, sorry. Um, let 
yeah, there was a river called the Kanaharan, Kan, Koharan Ragatun, or the River of Geese. And the Potomac was the northwest boundary of the northern Mech propriety. If the Kanharan Ragatun was a branch of the Potomac, then it was outside the boundary. So as we know today, the Potomac keeps going into what's even now West Virginia and is even a very small waterway that increases in size as it, as it reaches um, Harper's Ferry. But at that time, they, they had not really mapped that. They didn't really know that. So they made this argument, well, the Potomac starts at Harper's Ferry and from there heads east. And therefore, all of that land south of Harper's Ferry, the Shenandoah Valley, is actually not in the Northern Neck proprietary. It's not the property of Lord Fairfax. Um, so, you know, for the governor of Virginia, William Gooch, he really did need that buffer against the French to the West, the active Native American activity in the Shenandoah Valley, and bringing in new immigrants to this country served that purpose for him. It got the area populated. Um, as Julia mentioned, I'm also really interested in uh, the African American history of Virginia, and especially in the Shenandoah Valley. And I have heard others say another reason for populating the Shenandoah Valley with European settlers were that there was a fear of enslaved people on the other side of the, the Blue Ridge, um, very heavily populated with especially folks of British descent, large plantation holders that they were fearful that runaways were coming west over the Blue Ridge and into the valley um, and living basically um, among Native Americans, escaping, and then of course a fear that they could um, create communities, societies, and even probably and even possibly rise up against um, against the white population. I, I haven't confirmed that with many sources, but I've heard that that as another reason for settlement in the Shenandoah Valley. So um, the way that Governor Gooch was, you know, used to, I read earlier the quote where he was petitioning the British government to allow settlement, um, because of course, at this time, there were still a British colony um, in this country. And so he starts to issue land patents. So these are um, incentives, if you will, to have settler European settlers come through. And so some of the first patents he issued was to a party led by a man named Larkin Chu, which was um, for land near present day Front Royal. And that was in 1728. Um, Jacob Stover, um, a German, and Ezekiel Harland, a Quaker, lobbied England for land in the 1730s, and they were turned down. Um, and the phrase backside of Virginia actually comes from their petition. So what happens next is where the Belgrove story starts to form. In 1730, Governor Gooch granted patents to brothers John and Isaac Van Meter with the stipulation that they settle them with a certain number of families in a specific amount of time. These brothers feared they would not be able to make this deadline and wound up selling the patents to a party being organized by a German immigrant named Joost Height. And in 1731, along with his Scots-Irish Quaker business partner, Robert McKay, they requested patents for more than 100,000 acres, and they agreed to settle it all within two years with one family per 1,000 acres. And by 1732, Yost's wife, Yost Height, his wife, Anna, five sons, three daughters, which were all grown uh, children, along with their families, had started to settle the Shenandoah Valley. So settlers flowed in using the same path once used by animals and the Native Americans. Um, and now it was re-termed the Great Wagon, the Great Philadelphia Wagon Road, because so this, this influx of, of um, immigrants were coming through Philadelphia and that part of Pennsylvania. Um, so in just four years, by 1734, the colonial Virginia government was petitioning England to form Frederick County. And Isaac Yost Height issued 51 patents to 37 individuals for a total of the 47,000 acres, so about half of what he had promised. He had settled about 18,000 acres of his own. 
Um, they were meeting the requirements of the settlement, but they still were having trouble meeting their two, two year deadline. And so they had it arranged to have that deadline pushed back until 1735. So they're getting people here, they're settling them as, as planned, as stipulated in the patents, but they still needed more time. So this is a, uh, this is a marker um, talking about the Yost height and coming into Winchester. Um, some people will say he's the first, but as I mentioned, Mr. Chu was another one. Um, I usually say among the first, but you may have heard that. So here we have uh, Lord Fairfax. And meanwhile, he and his representatives are getting concerned about this land rush in the Shenandoah Valley. And so they pay a visit in 1736 and arrange for formal surveying throughout the region. And you might know of one of his surveyors that he hired, George Washington. So in his journal of 1748, Washington described his first journey into the South Branch of the, of the Shenandoah Valley over 40 miles as the, quote, the worst road that was ever trod by man or beast. Um, and soon it was figured out that the name of the river that I can't pronounce, the Cohongaratune River, was merely an extension of the Potomac um, west of Harpers Ferry. So, um, oops. Governor Gooch had been wrong about assuming that that, that the area um, of, the, of the Shenandoah Valley did not belong to Lord Fairfax. Um, and so this is where the story starts to get even stickier. In 1737, Height and McKay um, again approached the Council of Virginia for more land and they started being ref refused until, quote, the differences with Lord Fairfax could be, quote, be finally settled. So Lord Fairfax had begun to assert his authority and Height argued back in a document that he was um, behind on this settlement requirements because he was unwilling to run any further expense to lay out um, there's more small fortunes on improvements. So he just didn't want to have any issue with this land not being his to give away. Um, there's evidence that Lord Fairfax tried to be fair. He, uh, there's an example of a visit to, to one of the settlers um, and he'd say he would not have any poor man quite quit the, the place for want of land. Um, and then on a visit to height, Lord Fairfax seemed to blame the colonial government for overstepping their authority and told Height he could continue to issue, issue patents as long as the lands were surveyed and documented. Um, and this is where we run into the water issue. Um, Lord Fairfax was also in the business of selling patents and he was being very strict with the boundary lines and lot sizes. Height and McKay were asking higher prices, but they were being a lot more liberal about the lot sizes and shapes, realizing that settlers would want access to streams or brooks or other geographical features that would make the land more productive. So they were give, you know, it was more of a you have from the old oak tree down to, to the river type of agreements. Um, and, and whereas Lord Fairfax might want a nice square lot that he was selling. Um, so he would know exactly what he, what, you know, who is what and where. Um, this is a sketch of a building in um, Page County. They called Fort Egypt. And it's typical of what some of that early settlement homes might have looked like. Yost Height and his family initially settled, and I'll show you in a minute a, a map, pretty close to, to the, um, I believe the South Fork of the, I don't know, well, anyway, a fork of the Shenandoah River. Um, they settled fairly close to that, and, and then eventually uh, Yost Height moved up to be right on the Apecan River, or Apecan, Apecan Creek. Um, so this is an example. They had a home that was similar like this, we believe. It's long, long gone. Eventually, Lord Fairfax actually moved to his land in Virginia in 1747, and he asserted himself as the justice in all the counties where he had land, and he started to require that those who had received patents, say from the Height and McKay group, 
that they come have their land verified and repatented. And as you might expect, there were many boundary disputes. In 1752, uh, Lord Fairfax established his Frederick County property called Greenway Court, which is now in what's modern day White, White Post, Virginia and Clark County. And um, this is an image taken in, in 1933. And this is the only remaining building of Lord Fairfax plantation. This was a, an office of his. Um, one source I read said he had grandiose plan, plans for what amounted to be a palace, but those plans never materialized. Um, so he started to have a, this big brand estate in what's now Clark County, um, but it, it just never materialized. Um, and this is where the legal the legal fund starts. So ultimately, Yost Tight and his uh, a lot of the community members were starting to get a little little peeved at Lord Fairfax's reassertion of authority. They, you know, in good faith, thought they were giving this given this land. They had done very well. Um, they were essentially modern day land developers, um, and so they had done quite well. Their families had been established here. They were all engaged in farming, which was very lucrative because of the of that good soil. And again, part of that is the, um, the, the river system. And um, so ultimately, Yost Height, along with a whole group of co-litigants, including some of his, his children and their spouses, initiated a, quote, bill of complaint in the Williamsburg General Court Chancery. The litigation went on for years. Um, and during which time Yostite actually dies in 1761, leaving his heirs and co-litigants to continue the lawsuit. However, these were the same years of increasing tension with the colonial government in Britain. So even as the Re Revolutionary War broke out, Lord Fairfax considered himself to be a British subject, although he stayed quiet about that support. He stayed in Virginia the whole time of the war. And his long-standing friendship with General George Washington could very well have protected him, even in, when a 1779 law was passed prohibiting British subjects from holding land. So it's purported that when Cornwallis surrendered at Yorktown in 1781, Lord Fairfax took to his bed and died soon after his 92nd birthday. To so lived in 92 in that era is quite impressive. His heirs continued the legal battle, and it was not resolved until 1786, and finally in the settlers' favor, so in the Heights' favor. Um, so um, you can see, I mean, you may know, you know, Winchester history. Lord Fairfax is actually buried in Winchester at, on the grounds of Christ Church, um, Episcopal Church in downtown Winchester. So the Height family actually settled that mentioned when I mentioned before that that uh, log home with a stone base is quite near the North Fork. I was wrong; it's not the South Fork. It's the North Fork. Um, so they had ready access to it. They had a, a large plantation there. They called Long Meadows Plantation, and ultimately Yost Height's son Isaac Height um, lived and developed there and had his family there. Um, and the Height family, because of that settlement um, requirement that within two years, they bring a certain number of families, a thousand acre tracts, they wound up, their family wound up settling as far north as Lee Town, near Charlestown, what's now West Virginia, all the way down to the, this is in Warren County, but now, but um, basically, you know, the Shenandoah County, Warren County line at the southern part of Frederick County. So it's quite an expanse that the Height family had, had influence over. They, um, almost all of them rose to prominence, held positions in local government and local militias. Um, and, and so they were a very influential family of German background. Um, and then they started to mix in with some of the first families of Virginia, the British descended, um, group that had been on the other side to the east side of the Blue Ridge, but ultimately the very good agricultural land here enticed them to also seek patents and, um, and settle to settle in the valley. Um, 
in part two because they had depleted their land in the tidewater uh, farming tobacco without doing proper crop rotation. Uh, so today you can see a home on, on Route 11. It's if you're aware of uh, the Kernstown area south of Winchester on Route 11, you can see this home called Springdale. And there is a, a more historic marker to Yost Height outside of that. Uh, the home of Springdale was actually built by Yost's son, John. Um, there's some ruins on the property they think may have been connected to the height settlement along the Opecan. And, um, and ultimately this little area where there's evidence of a mill, mill area and a couple other homes. It's just a very little enclave of a few homes right along Route 11 um, has, has been re, returned Bartonsville because the Barton family lived in Springdale. Um, and during the Civil War, especially, um, we're a very prominent family that, that is in a lot of local history. So this, this is Springdale, that the home that is now where the red arrow is in, is in private property, but that's where the Height family cemetery is. Um, so there are a number of Height family members buried in the cemetery. And the home that's there now was built um, by another family. It, it, it's still historic, it has relevance, but it's, um, but it's, it's not from this era. So then ultimately, um, Isaac Height, who, who had lived at that property, um, he had one son named Isaac Jr. Isaac Jr. had, you know, now was the second generation to have been living in the valley. Um, his grandfather, you know, was the Im original immigrant, came with grown children, and then um, his, his generation were among the first born here in the valley. And he also grew some prominence and wealth inherited by his, his family and ultimately married into a first family of Virginia. He married Nellie Madison, the younger sister of James Madison, who was going to be ultimately president of the United States. And they had in time the ability to build the house that you see here. Um, and that is the historic site we operate today, Bell Grove. Um, from his father, he was given a little less than 500 acres, and um, from James Madison Sr., 15 enslaved people were deeded to the young couple, um, thinking, you know, this gets them on their way, um, and that includes Jerry, Jemmy, Millie, Sally, Eliza, and her five children, and True Love and her four children. Ultimately, Isaac Height Jr. would become one of the top four enslavers in Frederick County, which at that time, Frederick County was very large. It encompassed some of what's now Warren County and some of what's, um, all of what's now Clark County. Um, so he, we know from census record, he owned 103 enslaved people in 1810 and 101 in 1820. Um, and that was the peak amount. But um, our research is showing over time, Isaac Height Jr. Um, enslaved more than 270 men, women, and children. Um, this was ultimately the scope of the plantation, um, if you could see it here. Uh, he had many industries in addition to farming. So this was a grain plantation, as many were in the valley. So. Uh, wheat, corn, other mixed grains, barley, rye. Um, and so then he had a, a mill for grinding those grains. And of course you need water power for that. So the waterways you're seeing here are Meadow Brook, and then that empties into Cedar Creek, which then of course empties into, um, into the North Fork. Um, and so he had a sawmill as well that used water power and ultimately a distillery, which would have been a high water use activity. And so the enslaved workers are, are involved in these industries in addition to the agriculture and into the lifestyle in, in the, um, the manor house. Um, so we um, later on the Height family has has moved on as in 1860, it passes out of the family 
And there's, of course, the Civil War, of which the Shenandoah Valley was a key, key strategic location, in part because of the agriculture. So if you controlled the valley, you were controlling food production and which army would be fed by that food production. Um, in fact, some called it the breadbasket of the Confederacy because of its rich agricultural significance. But as you also know, where we are in the northern part of the valley is very close to the front lines of the war. Um, it changed hands a lot, just even having access to Route 11, what's now Route 11 or the Great Valley Pike, as it eventually became known, meant you could really move troops quickly. It's one of the few paved roads in the, in the Eastern United States. And of course, behind the Blue Ridge, you could move troops quickly and then attack Richmond or attack Washington, depending on what side you were on. Um, during the, right before the battle, what turned into the Battle of Cedar Creek, there were um, it was the headquarters of Philip Sheridan, and he had a huge number of, of troops, um, and they were all encamped at Bell Grove. So as far as you could see, there would have been troops camped there for about a ten-day break, um, and then from Massanutten, which is right outside our window, you could see exactly how those troops were laid out and that's how confederate general jubal early made his plan of attack and this is a an artist rendition of that early morning attack happening right outside of bell grove um the post-civil war years saw many, several many owners at bell grove including um so andrew jackson brumbach was a local family that purchased the house in 1709 um, they made it much needed repairs and they opened Bell Grove ultimately as an inn, the Brumbach family. And one of their frequent guests was this gentleman, Francis Hunnewell, who came from the Boston area. And his interest was really botany. Um, and so he wound up buying Bell Grove right at the eve of the Depression, had it very carefully restored, and ultimately left it to be a museum to the National Trust. Um, he was a curator of the New England Botanical Club, um, and he loved collecting botanical specimens. And we have his, his journal at, that he kept while he was stayed at Bell Grove, which mostly stayed here as a vacation property, um, but it's full of all sorts of interesting horticultural detail of things, specimens he's collecting, plants that he's planted at Bell Grove. Um, and when he left it to the National Trust, um, we, we have continued, he had a continued a relationship with the Brumbach family, and so do we, and they are actually still farming our property. They've, their family has farmed it for over 100 years. Um, in addition to historic preservation, we have tried to be a model for land preservation. Um, the National Trust now owns about 283 acres of surrounding farmland, in addition to what's on the historic property. And uh, we have that in farming and or conservation reserve enhancement um, in certain areas as well. We've been, done beekeeping on the property. We work a lot with the um, Shenandoah Valley Master Garden, Northern Shenandoah Valley Master Gardeners Association. They're very interested in pollination. And so in our garden, we have plenty of pollinators and, and we talk a lot about that as well. So, um, as I said, we're a site of one of the 28 sites in the National Trust for Historic Preservation portfolio. And we're also a member um, in the Cedar Creek and Bell Grove National Historical Park. So when the park was formed in 20, or 2002, Bell Grove was actually a legislated partner um, by Congress, along with Cedar Creek Battlefield Foundation, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, Shenandoah County Parks and Rec, and the Shenandoah Valley Battlefields Foundation. And we invite you to visit, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Kristen. That was really fascinating. Does anybody have any questions?
I guess I have one question, which is um, I saw on the map that there was a sinkhole identified um, <laughs> in the in the property. Is that still kind of falling into this day or has that been something? Yeah, it is. Um, it's it is. Um, I'll, I guess I'll keep sharing in case someone has a question about a slide I want to go back to, but um, we have a number of sinkholes on the property. So um, Bell Grove with Manor House itself is made out of limestone, locally quarried limestone. And you might know that um, to the west and south of Bell Grove is huge quarrying operation. So Carmoose Lime and Stone has um, giant, giant limestone quarries. Um, and so when you are on limestone and the water is coming, the groundwater is flowing in different directions, you will get little sinkholes. And so we have a number of active sinkholes. Unfortunately, in the past, the um, solution to a sinkhole was to use it for garbage. And, and so it was with the thought that they don't just get sucked into the earth, which um, just not a good idea, <laughs> really bad idea, especially with things like tires. Um, so we actually, uh, my one of my uh, colleagues actually led an initiative to clean out our sinkholes, which were, it was a huge endeavor. Um, and I think they hauled enough metal scrap out of one of them. I think they, at that time, the price of metal, I think they made it over a hundred dollars in just what they hauled out uh, and sold for scrap. So, um, yeah, so preservation takes many forms, conservation takes many forms, some of them aren't that pretty, but, but we do kind of keep an eye. There's some areas we hope to open, um, to open trails in the future, but we're having to sort of kind of keep an eye on some of those active sinkholes that um, it could be an issue. And with the quarrying, we're just not sure what could be happening with the groundwater, how that could get disturbed. Um, we have a pond on the property, or we did, and it's it's since dried up. In part, I mean, I think due to we aren't we classified as being in drought? Haven't we been in a drought state for a number of years? And it could be that, but we also wonder if something has just changed um, in how how it used to be fed and how it used to retain water, but it's it's all but dried up. Which is a shame because it would collect. We used to. It was a wonderful habitat for birds, and uh, we used to have a lot, a lot of different birds that that use that water source. Interesting. I had a question come in the chat about um, whether there are any interesting archaeology fi finds found in the sinkhole cleanouts. Oh, you know, we did. I don't think they involved any archaeology at that stage. Um, that would be interesting. We have had many other interesting archeological finds in other areas I can tell you about. Um, so we, for the last seven years, had an effort to do archeology span in the area where we believe the enslaved quarter sites were. And um, that was very, it's been a very successful project, very targeted areas that they excavated and we still have 60,000 artifacts that were found. Um, and those actually have just been put on exhibit um, in the manor house on the lower level of the manor house. So if you come for a manor house tour, you will have access to that exhibit. And there's also when we're open to the public um, at other times for self guided touring that will be open. So, for example, this Saturday, we are one of the sites of the historic historic garden week tour. Um, put on by the Garden Club of Virginia. And so we'll be open um, for people with that ticket, but I'll give you an inside scoop that we're also having just a discounted admission day. So the only house you wanna see is ours. You can come for a $5 admission fee and it's self-guided. So you have a chance to see that exhibit. Another really great time to come out to Bell Grove if you've never been is the Garden Fest. So that is a, a plant sale put on by the Northern Shenandoah Valley Master Gardener Association. Um, terrific deals on plants, $5 a plant, and that can include some shrubs, some perennials, it's a good value. And then 
plenty of master gardeners around to ask your questions. Um, also other really good vendors. And then the manor house will just be a $5 tour that day too. When is that garden sale? Oh, I'm sorry. I should have said that. Saturday, June 4th. And it starts early, early in the morning, 8 a.m., but um, goes until 3. Wonderful. Any other questions out there? All right. Well, Kristen, I just want to thank you so much for such a great presentation spanning so many hundreds of years. It was really, really lovely to hear all um, of that back historical context. Um, oh, are you doing any activities for the 250th anniversary at Bell Grove? 250th anniversary of Bell Grove? Oh, 250th anniversary, anniversary of Shenandoah of County at Bell Grove. Yeah, we are not. So Bell Grove is actually in Frederick County, mm. but we are aware of that anniversary and things going on with it. But as of yet, uh, don't think we have any plans, although we do have another property that is in Shenandoah County. So I, I, I know the president of the Historical Association, so I might, I, I might give her that option. <laughs> nice. So that's a good, good question. Yeah. Very good. Great. Well, thanks for your kind attention. I know that was a lot of history in a short amount of time. Um, but thanks for starting your lecture series with inviting me and I hope the rest of the series goes very well. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to share. We have uh, Michelle says thank you so much. And thank you guys all for being here. Here is a little look at the upcoming lectures in this series. On May 5th, we have a presentation by Corey Gilliams from the Smith Creek Partnership about um, Smith Creek and all of the restoration efforts that have been going on down there. We then, on May 12th, have a really interesting discussion by a past and present planner for Shenandoah County, Phoebe Kelby and Tyler Hinkle will be talking about their experiences um, planning for the county um, and different efforts to preserve our river in those. And then we close out the series with a presentation by Neil Thorne on the iron furnaces of Shenandoah County um, and ecological history. So Neil is a forester and a historian. So I'm sure he will have some really interesting um, things to talk about around the furnaces. And finally, um, we here at Friends are always out and about in the community doing fun things and helpful things for the river. We've got a great lineup of cleanups this weekend for Earth Day. Um, we've got a lot of stuff going on at Seven Bend State Park. We've got some opportunities to help maintain repairing and buffers in the area, um, monitoring opportunities, and there are always opportunities to get involved with watershed education. So if you're interested in any of these things, um, please give me a ring or an email at julia.sargent at fnfsr.org or on our website at the volunteer sign up. So thank you everyone and I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their evening. <laughs>